How many of you have left home and come back after a long absence? Maybe you went off to college, maybe you enlisted in the military, maybe you were kicked out of the house like me. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you got married, maybe you just, it, maybe it was just time to move out and you left and you came back and the home that you came back to was not the same home that you left. Have you had that experience? Um, and, and at some point it dawns on you that it's not so much the home that has changed, but maybe it's the home that hasn't changed at all, but you've changed. But it seems different. I grew up in northern Illinois in a, in a hundred-year-old farmhouse. Well, it was a hundred years old 45 years ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know where the farmhouse stands today. But I remember we had gone back for probably a funeral. It's the only reason I go back to my home region anymore. And everyone that's from that area has pretty much died. My grandparents uh, my dad's siblings say, it, I don't go back very often. We have a son buried there. Um, we just don't go back very often. But I remember the last time we went back and driving those old country roads back to where our house was. Um, we came down Rural Route 4 and uh, made a, a left-hand turn on what us kids used to call dead man's curve. We had seen a lot of car accidents ap happen at this curve because there were no signs, and, uh, and it was a hard bank, and, uh, and in the dark, people would come up on it quickly, and, uh, and bad things would happen. But we, we rolled out there, and the big farmhouse that I remember, the, the acres of pasture that I played in, the creek that, I, um, that I, I, I spent my days digging in the mud banks of, that I found out later was just field runoff. I was playing in pesticides. <laughs> Might explain some stuff. Huh. Who knew? Who knew? Uh, the, the frogs with extra legs should have clued me in. Right? But all of this stuff was as I remembered it, but not as I recalled. Does that make sense? Everything was smaller. Um, everything was overgrown. You know, the, the barn that my dad built, the, the, the roof was caving in. Things were falling apart. It was, it was as I remember, but not as I recall. And yes, some things had changed, but I discovered so much of what had changed was me. And this happens to us. This idea of coming home always sounds good until we get there. <laughs> and sometimes it's not as good. I love the fact, I, I, I say this often, I love the fact that we live in Wichita close to uh, my wife's side of the family. I always say when we moved here, um, we moved closer to Dana's parents, further from mine, so everybody wins. Um, and and I, I love this, but I, I've discovered um, that more and more when I get together with my side of the family, this may come as a surprise, we're all a little opinionated. Um, we all tend to stand our ground. And the sad reality is, from my perspective, they're all wrong <laughs> to a person. They just don't know it, and so it's my job to let them know, right? And I have found that, that when I go home, sometimes the long-distance relationship is the best kind of relationship to have. Um, coming home sounds warm and idyllic, and we have good memories, but sometimes coming home is hard. In our passage for today, and then again next week, we're going to look at the second half to this, of this story that I read this morning. Next week, Jesus came home. He came home to his town of Nazareth, and, um, and he was asked to speak in his local synagogue. I, I, my dad is now a retired pastor, pastor. 
and uh, the one and only church that he pastored for 30 years. Um, he, he, he moved there 30 years ago, and it's his, it, it is the church that he took right out of his, his Bible college days, and it's the church he retired from after 30 years. Um, but I remember the first time I was asked to preach in my dad's church. I was barely 20 years old, and I had just accepted Christ as my Savior. And I knew there was a call upon my life to full-time ministry, and so my dad said, well, you need to preach. And this was the week before I left to pursue my undergrad degree in Colorado. And I looked back at that sermon, and it was a joke. Not that I was telling jokes, I was really serious, um, but the whole sermon was a joke. And he asked me to come and preach not too long ago, this past summer, and, and, and I got done with that sermon, and he comes up afterwards, and he was proud. You know those moments when your, your parents are proud? He comes up afterwards, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, I wish, and he, start, he choked up. He said, I wish you could see what I see from that first sermon to this sermon. But things change, don't they? Nothing stays the same. So I was thinking about this in context of our passage. And a preacher that I heard this week helped me to understand what this passage maybe is about. Maybe to put it in a context that I understood a little bit better. And so I'm going to recapitulate some of the context that she provided for me in the sermon that she preached. But she painted this picture of a pew-packed church in the southern United States, a little church, pre-Civil War. She said that it was common in those days for slave owners to bring their slaves with them to church. Not all of them, but maybe those that were especially close to the family. Those that would attend to the needs of the family. But they weren't just bringing them um, so that they could attend to their own needs. Oftentimes they brought them as this weird way of teaching them the good news. But what did they hear? The slaves. What was good news? Um, we, we know that in those days, I've read many of the sermons, in those days the preaching of southern preachers from these small churches was really heavy on passages in Paul that said things like, slaves obey your master, and really light on stories out of Exodus that were about deliverance and the slave being redeemed. So there was a point to the sermon, and rarely the point to the sermon was the good news for the slaves. It was good news for the people sitting there that brought the slaves, but it wasn't good news. So they'd bring these slaves sometimes out of Christian duty. I feel like I need to add air quotes, Christian duty. However, the slaves never sat with their masters. We sit together in our groups and our families and our friends. We, we, we fit together in these, these pews and these places. But there, when you came in, it was the slave owners, the white people who would sit in the middle. The slaves weren't even told. They knew where they went. They went to the edges or the balcony or clear in the back. Um, and this was just their spot. So when they were preaching, uh, the pastor was speaking to the people in the middle. Except when he wanted to make a point to the people on the margins. This was the good news that was taught. Um, this good news for those sitting in the middle section was often bad news for the ones sitting at the edges or in the back or on the margins. Now imagine that one of the slave, slave owners had a son. And, uh, and that son had left, but that son had been raised in the community, had sat under the preaching of that same southern pastor, um, as a child had played in the homes of his neighbors, and now as a grown adult has come to church with his family one Sunday morning. He's been gone 
but he comes back. It's a small church, and in small churches, if, if the prodigal returns, what you do is you ask them to come and share a testimony or to read a passage or to stand up and pray. And so the pastor invites this young man, this son returned, to come and read scripture for the day. And everybody's excited. This community's favorite child has come home. And so he comes up on the platform and, and he opens his Bible to the lectionary reading for the day. Um, the, the prescribed reading for the day, uh, the way that, uh, that, that we move through Scripture. And so he opens his Bible and he comes to this passage, the passage that we heard read earlier. It's out of Isaiah chapter 58 and 61. But imagine in this context, most of us would be the ones sitting in the middle. Imagine this context, we now have a different congregation on the edges and in the back and up in the balcony and, 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 and this young man, this son, this favorite son begins to speak, begins to read from the Bible and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And now he looks up from the pages and he begins to recite the rest of the passage while his eyes move from the stoic faces in the center of the sanctuary, maybe to the sad eyes of the people at the edges and in the back and up in the balcony. And, and, and as he looks, as, as he looks, he continues the reading. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can you imagine how that would have been heard in this setting? The women and the men at the edges and, and the back in the balcony appear statue still, afraid to move, unblinking. The women and men in the middle begin to shift in their seats to look at each other with rising blood pressure and low murmurs begin. Then the young man says one last thing. Imagine this. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. How disruptive would that message be in that church? You see, this is what the good news is. If it's not good news for the edges and the back and the balcony, it is not good news for anyone. And this is the gospel. So now, can you picture the scene? Maybe with a little bit different a perspective. Jesus has come home to the little town where he has been raised. Everyone knew him as Joseph's son, a carpenter, a child of Nazareth. He was a Nazarene. Here he comes. He comes home. There was an assumption about Nazareth or really any small town of the first century world. The assumption was that you would live, work, marry, and eventually die in the same town that you were born in. If you're a Nazarene, you stay in Nazareth. This was the assumption um, and I suspect, though I can't prove it, but I suspect based upon the cultural expectations of the day that Mary and Joseph had even had an idea who, would jo who Jesus would someday marry. Perhaps a family friend or in those days a distant relative, part of the clan that they were a part of. You don't think about that. We know the 30 and 33 year old single male Jesus. You don't think about all of the plans that his parents had for him. And just like Joseph had been betrothed to Mary, probably at a very young age, chances are Jesus, through the, uh, the mediation of his family, had someone picked out for him as well. How awkward. How awkward to come home and all of this is happening. But now this favorite child of Nazareth has come back. He has come home. If you were raised in Nazareth, the expectation is that you would stay in Nazareth. So don't venture too far. Don't get any ideas. Don't outgrow your upbringing. 
Don't disrupt what has worked for us for generation after generation after generation. Some of you are familiar with the story of the fiddler on the roof. And it's that story. Don't mess with the tradition. And as soon as you mess with the tradition, uh, we feel very threatened. This is the context. Jesus' message this day was a threatening message. Sometimes we read these passages and we wonder, what was the big deal? But maybe this gives us some context. So earlier this month, some of you are familiar with the name Sidney Poitier. Oh, phenomenal, right? Earlier this month, Sidney Poitier died. In fact, he died on January 6th, um, the day in the Christian tradition that we celebrate as Epiphany. Also the day that we celebrated, celebrated, commemorated the... Uh, the first anniversary of the disruption of the Capitol. Um, I believe it was that day that Sidney Poitier died at the ripe old age of 94. Um, and what a life, what a career, what a, what a mark. He, uh, he, he was one that, that I was introduced to at a fairly young age because my parents knew about him. And I remember one of the movies in particular. I've not seen a lot of Sidney Poitier's movies, but I remember one of them in particular. Do you remember? Guess, guess Who's Coming to Dinner. What a great movie. Catherine Hepburn was in there. And, uh, um, oh, great names. Tra uh, Tracy, uh, Spencer Tracy. And a oh, great movie. It was released in 1967. 1967. Some of you are looking at each other going, wow, we're old. <laughs> the rest of us are looking down thinking, yeah, buddy. <laughs> right? But it was released in 1967. Here's the irony. It is about the guess who's coming to dinner was the white Catherine Hepburn introducing her fiancé, the black Sidney Poitier, to her family. Guess who's coming to dinner? Um, and the irony of that movie is, is that it, when it was filmed, it was still illegal in 17 states for an interracial marriage. Isn't that amazing? Six months before the release, um, those states finally reneged some of those stupid laws um, so that by the release date, it was legal throughout these United States. But at that point, it was still very controversial. And in fact, many of you know, uh, during its theater run, um, Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed, April 4th, 1968. And there was a line in that movie that was pulled from the theatrical version. It made it later in reproduction. And so now if you buy a copy of it, you, you will hear this line. But in the theater, it was not there because one of, uh, one of the lead characters asked the question or responded to the rhetorical question, guess who's coming for dinner? And her response was a snarky, well, is it the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.? Very snarky. And that was pulled because of King Jr.'s assassination but all of this was going on in real time it was incendiary in some regards because it it, it it presented a story that highlighted a problem hmm. it disrupted the status quo and this is exactly what Jesus was doing it's in the midst of these struggles that Jesus Speaks. I remember, you think, well, that was so long ago. I remember just four or five years ago from someone who used to attend here. I say used to. Maybe the story I'm about to tell is the reason why they don't any longer. But they called me and they said, Pastor, I need you to pray. I said, okay, what am I praying for or praying about? He said, well, my granddaughter is moving in with her boyfriend and then she whispers into the phone and he's black and i said this was four years ago and i said uh absolutely i'll pray but just to be clear what am i praying about the fact that your granddaughter is fornicating or the fact that he's black what is the prayer request here 
Hmm, kind of a terse moment. Right? Sometimes our lives need disrupted. Sometimes we need incendiary words in the midst of the status quo, in the midst of the normal. And sometimes it needs to come from our home boys, our prodigals who maybe have seen the deficiencies and speak truth, but it's a hard place to speak things like this at home. Home is a hard place for disruptive messages. Sometimes coming home is hard because in coming back to the place of your upbringing, you must confront first everything you've always known and assumed. Have you ever had something in your life that you've just known forever? You've just known it. And then you found out it was wrong. Do you remember how disruptive that was? I look back at early sermons I wrote. Things that I've preached, I keep them all on a file and occasionally I'll, 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 I'll pick through them to see if I said anything of value that I can reuse. It's not plagiarism if it's me. And so I'll pick through them and I'll read through these things and I'll go, wow, I was a real idiot. And I hope by God's grace someday in 15 years I'll look back at some of these sermons and I'll have grown enough that I'll go, wow, I was still an idiot. (laughs) Some of you are like, yeah, you don't have to wait 15 years. Just do it now. Um, but, uh, but, but this is the idea. There's things that we've just always known, whether they're in the Bible or in, in, in our places of familiarity, uh, the way that we've heard things growing up, whether in the church or in our, in our homes, the structures that have been in place that we just know. And because we just know them, we think that they're right. And sometimes we need that voice of disruption that sees things a little different to say, now wait a second. So here comes Jesus in this setting. The scroll was handed to him and he unrolled it to the place where the reader had left left off the the previous week at their synagogue gathering. In, In a weird way, Jesus was also following a kind of lectionary reading. Isn't that amazing? This is nothing new. My preaching through these regular ordered passages of scripture is nothing new. This happened to Jesus. And the great irony, we might say coincidence, or we might say in the great providence of God, was that the scroll the reader had left off just at the end of Isaiah, just before these passages that Jesus turned to. So the scroll was unrolled. He looks down at these passages. He's in Isaiah 58 and 61, and he combines these passages in a, in a tremendous homiletical way. That's a preacher word. Um, and, and, and wouldn't you know, the place where he left off was right at this point. Now imagine the scene unfolding in that moment. Here is Nazareth's child. What's he going to say? Oh, everyone's so proud. There he is. Um, they, had, they had heard some words already about him. Jesus had begun to make a name for himself. So it's like the, uh, the, the, uh, the small town little, little guy in the little leagues and then in the, uh, in, in the football teams and whatever that then makes it to the big leagues or the NFL, right? And they come home. And they've got a name and they come to their small town. So here's Jesus. He rolls into town. um, And and they might have heard of some of his exploits and thought to themselves, can you believe he's he's from Nazareth? He's a Nazarene. He's one of us. Look at what's happening. You know, there's that element of pride. Can you believe all of this? Who would have thought that Joseph's son would become someone of such renown? And as, as, as he rolls the scroll, as he rolls the scroll, he, he reads these words that we read earlier. 
these incendiary words, but they weren't heard as incendiary. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Uh, These weren't incendiary words by themselves, but what he did with them, how he interpreted them, how he applied them, caused a disruption. So he reads it, he rolls up the scroll, he hands it back to the attendant. Everyone in Jesus' small country church waited to hear what he had to say. I suspect there was a long pause as Jesus reflected on the words. I imagine an awkward silence. You ever do that when maybe a young preacher or or someone who's inexperienced on the platform, you can see that they're struggling and you just kind of feel nervous for them. You feel awkward for them and you offer those silent prayers. I I wonder if there was that kind of awkward pause as Jesus reflected on the words, Um, that awkward quiet as they waited for him to say something into the quiet room after, and, and then finally after all of the shuffling dies down, after everyone was done waiting, holding their breath, what would this Nazarene say? Jesus spoke very simply, today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That did not go over well. That was not the sermon they were expecting. With those words, Jesus disrupted the status quo. He would later in that same setting tell two stories of Elijah and Elisha. They were Israel's favorite prophets. They were the stories that everyone liked to talk about. The way that we go back to familiar verses like John 3, 16 and Romans 8 and these other high points of scripture, Philippians 2. Um, They would tell the stories of Elijah and Elisha. They were favorite prophets. Um, But the stories that Jesus picked out were not the stories that they wanted told. He picked out two stories. One was of a a foreign woman, a Sidonian woman, a widow uh, who was impoverished, who had no recourse uh, for life. So Jesus gives her, um, or I'm sorry, Elijah provides for her some vessels that that, that miraculously stayed filled with the the things that she needed to sustain her family. But But the point of Jesus telling the story was to remind them that Elijah was speaking to someone who was not an Israelite, someone on the edges or the back of the room or the balcony. The second story he tells is a miracle of Elisha. And if you're familiar with that story, it's even a little more disruptive. A a Syrian general came seeking help. Syria was constantly engaging Israel in war. And so not only was he a foreigner... He was an enemy of the state. And he came seeking healing from, uh, from, uh, from leprosy. And, and Elisha performs a miracle with him and sends him on his way. It would be tantamount today to us praying and performing a miracle for Hitler. And these stories did not go over well at all. It was disruptive these words today this is fulfilled in your hearing where where the captive is set free the blind are given their sight the the impoverished are redeemed out of their poverty all of these things he's looking to the margins and he's saying in me today this is fulfilled and then he finishes with this line. Um, he reminds us that it is the year of the Lord, the day of Jubilee. Um, in, in the Old Testament, the day of Jubilee was a semi-centennial event. It happened every, well, honestly, Israel never did it. Um, but uh, it happened every 50 or 51st year. And on that day, foreclosed land would return to its previous owner. Prisoners would be set free. Debts would be forgiven. It was supposed to be a national, uh, a national recompense. Israel never celebrated a, 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 a jubilee. But Jesus said by his coming, the jubilee, 
is in their midst. Forgiveness of debt. The, the blind see. Uh, the prisoners are set free. You see, this is what Jesus is saying. It was a disruption to the status quo. So the sermon that they were not expecting does not fall on deaf ears. Sometimes as a pastor, you know when you've preached a good sermon because everyone hates you. <laughs> Sometimes. The people wanted Jesus of Nazareth to be a Nazarene. God help us. They needed him to be a Nazarene. That is to make certain the systems that they had worked for so long in Nazareth um, would continue to work again and again and again. These things that had benefited them. They needed to continue to enforce those things. So you can imagine words like, you don't rock the boat being said. Or even words like, mission begins at home. Oh, yeah, true words, but it also extends to Guatemala. Shout out. Right? But I hear this a lot when we plan these trips. Well, why are we investing so much in going to El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, wherever we're going? We have so much need here. We do. We absolutely do. But the mission of God is a broader mission. And this is part of what Jesus is saying. Don't rock the boat. Mission begins at home. Or maybe even something directly from this story. Right in our text. Who does he think he is? Don't outgrow your upbringing. Don't forget where you come from, son. This idea. So here's this disruptive message. That Jesus, the home boy, is delivering to his own hometown folks, people that knew him as a baby, people that saw him as a 14 or 15-year-old when parents think about homicide as a way of lulling themselves to sleep, <laughs> right? They knew him at his best and his worst. You're like, well, how bad can it be with Jesus? He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, which means he also went through things that we went through. He never sinned, but you can be a miserable teenager without sinning. It's the parents who have the problem. But, uh, but here he is. He, he, he disrupts the hometown's folks. He's looking beyond the boundaries of what has always been to a world that needs some good news. And in a sense, they're sitting there saying, yeah, but what about us what about us but his message is to the edges because it's not good news unless it's good news to everyone and so he begins speaking to the edges of the assembly the back and the balcony of society he talks about the poor. You see, his message was to those who are poor, who possess nothing but the clothes on their back. It is to those who live in the constant state of an impoverished heart behind the fog of hopelessness, maybe behind uh, the, uh, the despair of depression and anxiety, the worry about making ends meet, the hand-to-mouth kind of day-in and day-out living. To them, he says in his Sermon on the Mount, you think you've got nothing, but you're wrong. You are actually blessed because you will inherit the whole earth. <laughs> you who can't own land, hold land. The land you even farm is it your own. You can't make it from day to day. You can't even inherit land and you're going to leave nothing for your uh, descendants to inherit it, inherit. But guess what? Because of all of this brokenness, you are especially blessed because you will inherit the whole earth. All of it becomes part of who you are. You see, his message was to those who are poor. Do you see how that disrupts the status quo? The landholders, the powers that be, it's the year of Jubilee. It's the time when that which has been robbed re is returned to those to whom it originally belonged. And the land has been held captive by sin and slavery and death. It happened in the garden. It spread throughout creation. And it's been possessed 
possessed by sin that has infected it down to the roots and deeper still. And God is saying, the blessed are the poor who have eked out their living, scratched, uh, scratched amidst the thorns a little bit, just enough to fill their stomach for today. He says, blessed are you because what has been robbed from you by sin will be restored to you in its fullness. Blessed are you. His mission is to the poor, not to the powerful who have all that they need. Oh, there's a word to the powerful, but he begins at the margins and in the back and in the balcony. His word is to the captives. His message is to those who are held captive. To them, he says, I have come to set you free. Jesus' people wanted him to disrupt the Roman government. That's what they wanted from him. That's what they expected from him um, because they were the ones possessing their land. Instead, Jesus offers a liberty to his people that cannot be controlled by governmental or empirical dominance. He offers them a different kind of freedom. It's not freedom from the oppressive government, whether it be Rome or any other government. It's a whole different kind of freedom, a freedom that does not necessarily remove them from the empire in which they are held captive, but makes them citizens of a very different kingdom altogether, a kingdom of heaven. It's a transfer of citizenship, not an expelling of governmental authorities. But it is still disruptive because when the kingdom of God conflicts with the kingdoms of man, uh, sparks will fly, fireworks will ensue. And so he comes proclaiming liberty, liberty from anything that holds us captive, uh, the, the kind of liberty that releases us from unholy fear, the kind of liberty that looses us from addiction and destructive habits, the kind of liberty that forgiveness of that, the kind of liberty that forgiveness of sins that won't let us go and empowers the lives of freedom that will not be shaken. It's a liberty given that cannot be taken, usurped or lost. Liberty, liberty, this is what he comes to proclaim. And it's disruptive. It's disruptive because we need people who are addicted. We need people who are broken. We need people who are forgotten because they are the chattel upon which our society runs. And we need them. So when you disrupt this system, when captives are set free, when, when addictions are redeemed, when lives are restored the system itself begins to crumble because it's been built on the wrong premise. So he disrupts by speaking to the poor. He disrupts by speaking to the captives. He disrupts by speaking to the sick. The eyes that have not seen will begin to see again. You're like, well, why couldn't he have used, you know, a bad heart, you know, the, the heart that doesn't beat right will begin to beat right. Again, the cancer that is eating your body away will be removed. Why does, why eyes, why blindness? Because I think not only is he talking about spiritual healing, but I think he's talking about true spiritual sight in this as well. So his message is to those maybe who are defined by their physical condition. Yeah, our illness, our brokenness, these things that uh, manifest in our bodies. To them, he says that there is a kind of healing that changes your identity. You are no longer defined by your brokenness, the infirmity, um, what you've caught and who you've given it to. That's not your defining characteristic. Your defining characteristic is that you are a kingdom. You are a, a, a child of the kingdom of God. And so he says to them, there is a kind of healing that gives you new eyes. Eyes that sees the world for the first time. There is a blessing of infirmity. A blessing in sickness. It, it is, it, it, the blessing in sickness is, is this idea of strength and weakness. A little over a year ago, I picked up a book out of the blue it was recommended to me by my friend Charlie. Charlie passed a little over a year ago. And, uh, and the book was about a man whose life was being claimed by cancer. And just like Charlie, that cancer ultimately took his life, the author as well as Charlie's, 
And in the book, he said, I prayed for healing. I prayed for healing. He says, but I, I come to learn something. He says, I wonder if healing is actually given to those of lesser faith because they don't have enough faith to endure the travail. And what a way to turn that around. There is a blessing in infirmity. And it is the blessing of weakness. It is, it, it is, it is the blessing um, it, it is the blessing that comes to us that we can do nothing except through Christ alone. Weakness, illness, brokenness is not always met with a physical restoration, but it can be met with a powerful grace that moves us into places of service that we could never have gone otherwise. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul's request of the Lord that, that he take from him a thorn in the flesh. You remember that? Paul three times asked to have a thorn in the flesh removed. Many have speculated what was the thorn in the flesh. Um, I, I'm convinced it was a physical, a physical thing. A thorn in the flesh. The Greek word is sarx. It means body. That he was experiencing a physical condition. But the theories have ranged, have, have gone the gambit on what that was. It was a spiritual condition. It was something that came maybe from the beatings, the floggings, the stonings that he endured. One commentator even suggested, I'll look this way, even suggested that it was a mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> the audacity the audacity. Um, that was not this commentator for the record. Um, right? But, but, but Paul prayed three times. You remember three times he asked God to remove the physical infirmity and each time God's answer to his request was, with the, was, was the words, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. There is a sense in infirmity and sickness and in our blindness where God's power is made more manifest because of our weakness. And so Jesus is, sp is speaking to them. Do for us, later you would hear the words, physician, heal yourself. Do for us what you've done for others. Why aren't you fixing our problems? You've done it for everybody else. Why not here? Sometimes there is a blessing in not being fixed. Because in not being fixed, you find that God is made all the more powerful. Sometimes in our strength, we get the idea that we're doing it. That we're enough. That we can accomplish this. Sometimes we need illness, sickness to change us. I often say, my heart attacks saved my life. I was a very destructive, self-destructive little brat. And nothing was going to slow me down and I was going to do bad, bad things. There's something about a chronic heart condition that saved my life. And I, I think there's wisdom in there for us as well. So he speaks this disruptive message to the poor, to the captives, to the sick, and then to the oppressed. And his message is to those who are under the heavy hand of the oppressor, whether it is governmental like Rome or it is personal like home. Right? He speaks to the oppressor. It is to those who carry the heavy loads that the world piles on. Those things that threaten to crush us. Some of you understand what this means. You bear this load for your family or, or maybe for your friends. You're the one everyone calls when life is falling apart. And you carry this with you and it feels like it's crushing you. And then when your life is falling apart, you wonder, who do I call? Who counsels the counselor? Who pastors the pastor? when it's all falling apart, right? You, you understand the weight, the crushing, the crushing weight of the burden. It's an oppression sometimes. And it's a ministry. We carry each other's burdens. That's in scripture. But sometimes it threatens to crush us. Or maybe that oppressor is something more malevolent, not quite so benign. And maybe, maybe it's something, some, maybe it's an, an abuser. Maybe it's an employer. Maybe it's the stupid person in the lane next to you on the road. That was me, by the way. 
him, right? So whoever it was that was telling me that I was number one. <laughs> yeah. Silver lining, silver linings. But, but here's the idea. He says, to the, he, he says that, that, that to the oppressed, there is liberty. There is liberty. Um, there is liberty from this burden, this thing that seems to be crushing. But I'm reminded again of Paul's words to us in this. What kind of liberty? It's a different kind of liberty. And I want to read it together. In fact, I think we need to read it together. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verses 7 and goes through 12. I'm going to put it on the screen. Let's read. Here's Paul's response to this. It says, Now we have been given a great treasure in jars of clay, in cracked pots. You're the cracked pots. I'm the cracked pot. So that we might show the surpassing po- that, the, that the surpassing power belongs to God and to us. For we have been afflicted in every way. We are not crushed. And we have been confused by the brokenness of the world. But we do not despair. At times we have even been persecuted and abused. But we are not forsaken. We have been struck down and silenced. But we are not destroyed. For we are always carrying in our bodies the death of Jesus that the life of Jesus will also be made real in our bodies. For death is at work in us, so that the life of Christ might flow into you. Aren't those good words? This is, this is what liberty to the oppressed means. This is a disruptive message. It's disruptive to the people in the center. But it's liberty it's good news for the people at the edges and in the back and on the, in the balcony. This is the message of hope that Jesus preaches in his hometown, but it is not received well. Why? Because it points to those at the edges, but gives the responsibility of that message, that message of hope to those in the middle, those who belong. It would be easy to think that a life of faith is what I live as a way of benefiting myself. But that's not the case. Uh, I, I would like the idea of a life of faith that benefits myself without ever disrupting the world around me. But we have been called to be holy disruptors. Amen. To bring the good news to people whom life has, who life has left disrupted and abandoned. In fact, in fact, we want a message that offers hope without the necessity for change. But that is not the gospel. You see, change is the gospel. Change is the gospel. Change is the good news. To be sure, it does begin at home, but home is often the hardest place to begin. And it is not always well received, maybe especially at home, but certainly when it disrupts the lives that we've always lived and the things that we've always known. Change is the attitude of repentance. And it is the promise that something new is emerging out of something old. It is this promise of birth in the midst of death. It is joy in the midst of suffering. It is peace in the midst of the storm. It is freedom in the midst of bondage. It is light in the midst of darkness. It is hope in the midst of despair. You see, something needs to change. And it, it goes to the margins. It goes to the back. It goes to the balcony. This is the promise of Christ. And what he said 2,000 years ago still resonates with us today. Uh, these words we still hear even this day, 2,000 years later. This day, it has been fulfilled in your hearing. You are the fulfillment of Christ's disruptive message. So it comes down to this, and this is the one point. You're like, Pastor, where is all this going? It's going to the last three sentences. Here's the one point you've got to hear. Home is not home until it includes the homeless. Home is not home until it includes the homeless, the lost, the broken, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the overlooked, the unclean, the unwanted. Home is not home 
until it includes you. In this, there is a promise for us. The home that we finally arrive at is the home that God has been building all along. So this is the hope, this is the disruption to your life, and this is the promise that Christ gives to us today. Pray with me.